All right, I'm <clears throat> just going to start the recording now. So, hey, everyone. Um, my name is Kevin. I'm an MD3 at the University of Melbourne. And um, welcome to another Phrases webinar. Just a couple of um, sort of housekeeping things for today. If anyone has any questions, just please put it in the chat. Um, please let me know if you can hear me and also if you can um, see my slides. Thanks. Uh, good day, David. Good day from WA. I'm in Vic. Um, and um, today we're going to be going through uh, just a little bit of information about GemSAS applications, um, specifically talking about some um, tips as to how you can actually go through your GemSAS application, which is opening on the 1st of May. Um, I'll tell a bit of my story and also some of the pitfalls that, I, that, that happened to me in the two times that I, that I applied. Um, and um, yeah, feel free to um, ask any questions that you'd like. Um, also, if anyone is, is comfortable enough to unmute and also ask a question, I'm happy for you to do that as well. Just interrupt me at any point in the webinar as well. So um, I'm just still admitting a few people who have come in a little late. So I'll just sort of keep an eye on that as I go through. So um, just um, to get it uh, just to get a bit interactive um, during the session, I just want um, everyone to give me a bit of a reaction as to sort of how they're feeling. So are you feeling so? Give me a thumbs up if you're feeling good about med applications sort of coming up and 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 starting soon. Just want to get a general feel of the audience here. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, that's, that's unfortunate. I'm, I'm seeing a few um, sort of crying emojis. <laughs> Anyone else? Do you guys <clears throat> have one of my applicants who are applying after a PhD? Okay. You know what? No, I'll address a lot of the, a lot of the sort of um, questions in the chat in a bit. So yeah. Um, no, look, it seems like Generally, people are relatively happy that applications are starting. I know it's a really um, nervous time for everyone. Um, it was nervous for me as well <laughs> when I went through it. So um, yeah, I completely understand how you're all feeling. All right, so let me just um, start off. Uh, so uh, this is me, so it's good to meet you. Um, as I mentioned for the people who um, are new that have just come in. So I'm, I'm Kaiwen, I'm an MD3 at the University of Melbourne. Um, feel free to ask me any med questions as well. If you have any pressing questions about uh, the medical course or just how medicine is like in general, um, since you're not in it yet. Um, so yeah, um, just today's agenda. Um, we're going to just take a look at GEMSAS applications overall. We're going to talk a lot about deadlines because it's really important that you follow the deadlines very clearly. Uh, medical schools are they just don't care if you um, if you uh, don't hit a deadline and you have sort of like an unforeseen circumstance they don't care they will um, just chuck your application in the bin um, they take it very very seriously so um, just gonna drum that down to you guys today um, I want to talk about how to preference that's a really common question that I get a lot of the time like what should I put first what should I put second does it matter if I put like UniMeld first over UND um, we're also going to talk about rural documentation and some additional criteria. So stuff like CASPA, just going to run through it really, really quickly, even though we've already run through it last week. Similarly, rural documentation bonuses, specifically for Deakin University, if anyone knows about that and is thinking about um, sort of um, applying for Deakin. And also any tips moving forward um, that I have for you, specifically with, um, with, with interviews, because uh, interviews are coming up soon. Interviews are really, really important. And... Um, if you um if you didn't go to our webinar last week, um, it's very it's very common for students to get incredibly high GAMSAT scores, have a killer application, and then they don't get in because they don't have uh, because they don't perform well in the interview on the day. So you don't want to be one of those people. Um, so uh, let's just uh, um, start by just uh, giving a bit of an overview on uh, GEMSAS applications and sort of as I continue, um, as I said before, um, if you have any questions, please put it in the chat. Um, and I'll sort of answer it, I'll answer them periodically throughout this entire, this entire webinar. So uh, firstly, um, let's, let's just talk about GEMSAS a little bit. So um, I have a, a few things on the agenda that I just want to just clarify. So, so GEMSAS here, um, so as you all know, it's like the main body uh, to, as to where you apply for all of the GEMSAS related medical schools. 
Now, there are other bodies out there that also exist, but they're independent to GEMSAS. So specifically, those ones are University of Sydney and University of, oh, sorry, and Flinders University. They have their own application processes. If you want to apply for those two universities, you have to go and do their own process separately with the university themselves. And we'll have another webinar on um, entry and, and sort of application information for um, UCID and also Flinders in the future. But for now, we're just talking about GEMSA. So that's this is like UniMel, UND, UQ, Macquarie, pretty much all of those universities, right? And they have their own external process that you sort of go through. And I'm sure everyone already knows that um, now. But if you don't, now you know. Um, so firstly, really, really important that you understand that GEMSAS applications, they open on the 1st of May and they close on the 31st. So um, my advice to you guys, and something that I like wish I did the first time that I applied, was um, I would start my application on the 1st of May. Even if you don't finish the application, you can save your progress as you go and put your pre put, put your preliminary preferences in and read through, like you spend like a solid day going through the GEMSAS website, writing down all of the different universities that you're interested in going to and reading thoroughly all of their application information. Each university has a different um, sort of set of criteria that they're looking for. And on the GEMSAS website, if you just go to this link that I have here, oh, sorry, actually, let me just go back. If you just go to this link here that I have, um, you, you'll be able to find um, like all the different spots that they give. So they'll, they'll give you a breakdown of CSP versus BMP spots versus full fee spots. And they'll also give you an application breakdown as to like what you specifically need. So maybe you need like a portfolio, maybe you need like a, um, like a Casper test. And they'll tell you like the importance of those tests as well. Do you need to just pass that or do you need to actually get a score that's competitive? Um, so getting really well-versed with all of that for your university is extremely important. So don't stinge on that. It's for your own future, okay? So what happens is when you sort of like, um, so just going through um, the sort of timeline here. So if you look like we're in March, oh, sorry, March is already gone. Um, April now, uh, we're here. Um, they sort of mentioned here that you have to have your official academic transcript if, um, if you attended any uh, non-arts um, sort of university. So arts is essentially just, um, I forgot what the acronym means, but it's essentially universities that allow you to automatically get your transcript by um by like like through like an electronic system and um you just need to make sure like and i'm not I'm, most of the people that applied for gemsas usually come from like arts tertiary institutions like unimel monash all that sort of stuff um but if you but if you're not sure please just make sure to check that online and then the last thing that i should mention is um i know that some universities like university of melbourne they have like a student equities fee that you have to pay like right before about this time of year. And um, if you don't have that paid, they won't release your transcript if GEMSAS, uh, like after you finish your GEMSAS application. So make sure to pay that fee because the worst situation is if you haven't paid that fee, you've submitted your application for GEMSAS, then after the application deadline closes, you pay the fee and then GEMSAS just doesn't get your, your, like, your transcript. And then from there, you're kind of screwed because you've messed up your application. They won't take another application from you. And you have to sort of go back and forth with GEMSAS to ask them for another chance, which, you know, they might give you another chance, but um, you don't want to be in that situation. So make sure that you check that all your fees are up to date. You're paid everything that you need to so that your transcript can actually be sent to GEMSAS when you actually submit your application. So then obviously in May, we have 1st of May, um, medical applications open and then 31st of May, they close. Um, and then sort of looking forward to that, there's a bunch of other deadlines regarding sort of rural documentation and um, sort of like deadlines to like submit official transcripts and whatnot. Now, if you don't have an, um, an official transcript that is from an arts university, then you need to uh, submit your application um, separately and then you upload your transcript separately as well. Um, so make sure to keep that in mind. So really, really important because I know uh, people who have... Uh, sort of failed applications because they haven't paid that fee and then GEMSAS hasn't gotten their transcript. So um, really important that you guys sort of know that. One thing that a lot of people also ask um, is GPA and sort of how it's calculated, what it's weighted. Now, GEMSAS, like the guide um, that GEMSAS has online 
has this really fantastic um, full PDF document that tells you how GPA um, is calculated across all different universities and the differences between all of those different GPA calculations. So for example, UniMelb has a weighting of two, two, and one. So third year is counted times two, second, uh, second year is counted times two, and first year is counted times one. So it's it's back-ended for your degree. So your, 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 your degree is, wet, like getting good scores is better in your second and third years compared to first year. And I know that some universities have like an equal weighting, um, like first year, second year, and third year. And then some universities have first year is times one, second year is times two, and third year is times three. So um, your GPA will change depending on which university you apply to um, because um, they'll they'll sort of calculate it a bit differently. So it's it's important for you to sort of understand how your GPA changes. And that could definitely... Um, increase your chances of getting into one u- one university versus another, just purely based on rules. So my best advice is to know what your GPA is in pretty much every possible type of calculation. So once you read through the GEMSAS guide, you'll know what like which universities calculate GPA in what way. And then you should take some to calculate your own GPA. Now, um, you, you can do it either by hand or you can actually put all your scores into the GEMSAS GPA calculator, which I've actually put a picture here for you just to show you what it looks like when you try and put it in, uh, put it sort of like on the page. Now, when I was applying for medicine, this didn't exist. You had to pay to get your GPA um, sort of done. Um, and admittedly, I don't know if they calculate your GPA in all three ways using this particular um, sort of method. So, So my best advice to you is, Don't rely on just looking at this value. Calculate the GPA yourself and follow the rules as to how to calculate them so that you know um, sort of of what to do so so you don't get it wrong. Once you sort of know your GPA for all the different universities, like once again, it gives you just more information as to how um, you can um, sort of go about putting preferences in and also um, potentially what universities might be more applicable to you or not. So then sort of after all of this is um, like sorted and you've put your application in, now like remember, um, like we'll go through preferences and whatnot in the next slide. Um, but once you've finished all of that, then you sort of have this little lull period where you just have a bunch of like deadlines that you have to fill. Some For some people, there's really no deadlines to fill and there's no supporting documentation that you need to uh, put in. And then after that, um, we sort of get to August where it's like a full dead month. Um, uh, I believe University of Sydney offers do come out at around about August, September. But once again, that's a different um, application process compared to GEMSAS. So when I got into medicine, so I I, I got an offer from UCID and I also got an offer from the University of Melbourne, but I got my offer from UCID early. Um, So I knew that I had already got a guaranteed med spot before I actually did my interview, which was was great for me because um, it made me feel great. Um, and more confident going into my interview. Um, so I'm, 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 and I'm pretty sure you said applica- you said like med offers also come out before. So um, keep that in mind um, because that's usually the important thing that happens in August. And usually in August, people are just preparing really hard for the interview. And then in September and like early October, that's where interviews are held. And um, and you sort of get your interview offer like relatively close to the actual interview day, um, which is like maybe a couple of weeks out. Um, so it's really important to, sort of uh, make sure that you sort of look at that. Now, I just had a question here that, um, could you please touch on how the UAC and CASPER differ in their GPA calculation? Sorry, I'm actually not sure what's what's UAC. Could you just um, um, sort of clarify that? The, and you said, do you know what? Okay, well, yeah, okay, so, so I'll answer all the UCID questions probably in the UCID webinar. So that's, and, and I'm running that because I know a bit about UCID um, in this application because I, I messed up my UCID application. Um, and that's a funny story. Um, but um, uh, in terms of, um, so CASPA, so CASPA is a different sort of examination that you need to take that's completely separate from your GPA. So um, what the CASPA is, is it's essentially a situational judgment test that you take and um, two universities use it. So it's UND and University of Wollongong. And um, I, from what I understand is you need to get a certain pass mark in order to be considered and it, and your score has to be relatively competitive compared to the cohort of people that are taking it. So it's important to do well on the CASPA. 
And um, the, the types of questions that they ask you are like sort of scenario based questions that are relatively ethical in real everyday life. So it could be a question about like, a, you know, the, you're, you're working as a cash register and then someone comes in and asks for a refund on an item, but had, but doesn't have a receipt, but then they tell you that they need it because they need to pay a medical bill that's really urgent. So then you have to sort of write down the ethics behind that and sort of make a decision as to whether you want to uh, you want to give that refund or not ultimately. Um, it's not a multiple choice test and it takes about 100, 100, 100 to 120 minutes for the entire examination. Um, and um, usually they have sort of like one stem and then they have about, I think, it, I think it's about three questions like underneath that stem that you just have to answer manually. Um, so, um, okay, yeah. And then the next one is, um, so, so yeah, um, that's, that's sort of um, like how um, the CASPER differs to GPA calculations. So they're separate, Roma, like, but they're only for two different universities. So UND and, U and University of Wollongong. Um, and, um, in terms of GEMSAS, could you please touch on how GEMSAS and, um, CASPER differ in their, G uh, so, yeah, sorry, I'm not, I'm still not really too sure what UAC means, but, um, anyway, look, um, if you could just give me a message with like what, just clarifying that, then that would be good, but I'll just move on to the next part because I think I just want to run through everything first before I just answer questions for the rest of the, um, the time. Um, so, but if anyone has any questions specifically about like the GPA um, calculations or the timeline um, and sort of how it, how it operationally works, just let me know. Uh, can I get my GPA calculated from GEMSAS if my results are from overseas? Yes, you can. You can definitely. And you can contact GEMSAS and I believe you can get that done. Um, and I've actually put the GEMSAS email um, here. So info at gemsas.edu.au, that's, that's, that's the email that you, that you should contact um, to get pretty much any anything done <laughs> and to get any sort of um uh sort of uh I guess um query sorted okay um how do they count sem2 of last year of offers come out uh of last year if offers come out at the end of october so what they do is they give you a provisional medical offer so yeah it's a it's a it's a really good question um so what happens is um so if you're finishing third year this year and let's say up to this point in the degree, let's say up to like right now and after your first semester of results, um, which they'll have, right? When they give you the med offer because they'll, they'll take into account your first semester of results. They'll sort of look and they'll see, okay, look like this person has like a 6.8 GPA, you know, like they've done well in their interview, their game set's pretty good. Let's give them a medical offer, but they'll give you a provisional med offer, which is, which is essentially you like they'll, they'll stipulate that you can't get below a certain like your, your gpa can't fall below a certain point or you have to maintain that gpa at a certain point in order for you to to, to successfully like turn that provisional offer to a full offer um and um usually it like from now i didn't get a provisional offer because i i got in like uh, after i finished my third year so i, I and during my gap year but um, from what I understand from my friends who did get a provisional offer is it's pretty difficult for you to sort of dip below the threshold. Um, and it's very, it's a very fair threshold to, to, to sort of, um, fit in. And they look at like trends as well on your, you know, like of your GPA and they sort of take into account like your, um, yeah, like they're, yeah, like they sort of take into account like your whole degree's worth of like results and see how you're actually tracking. And they can also take a look at some of your, second semester, like midterm results as well, in order to make that decision too. Um, if a student has done part of their degree in 2020, would they include it for the applications this year or would it still be excluded? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I believe all the pandemic, um, I believe all the pandemic stuff is, um, oh, I'm actually not sure. Yeah, you know what, actually, I'm not too sure. That's, that's, a, that's a good question. It's probably good to look at the, the GEMSAS guide for that. Um, there should be like a stipulation for that. Um, my understanding was, uh, and th this is like not official information, by the way, like my, this is only my understanding from what I remember is that like, you have a choice, um, as to whether you want to include it or not. Um, but once again, that, that could have changed and it might just be completely excluded. Um, I, I do remember that at some point, like those results were completely excluded. I don't know if that's changed or not. So um, once again, really important for you guys to just look through the GEMSAS guide, read everything, and 
make sure to get familiarized with all that. Cool. Um, so, um, sort of looking at some of the additional requirements here that um, I want to just sort of like stipulate on. I have a list of things that I just want to um, sort of run through. Um, this is mainly to just keep my mind fresh so that I don't miss any of this. Um, but uh, let's just go through these one by one. So, so CAS score I've already mentioned. So it's U it's University of Wollongong and UND. Your score does matter. So make sure that you do your adequate prep for the Casper. You know, do the practice paper that that um, the that Casper gives you, and then potentially just um, like the best way that I recommend to sort of prepare for the Casper is prepare for interviews because interviews have a lot of ethical scenarios, and then you also can sort of double up by doing it by also like thinking about ethical scenarios for the Casper too. Um, so that's really, really good. Um, so uh, take it seriously um, and, and don't take it lightly because it, it, is a, it, it can be a challenging exam for, 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 for some. Um, for portfolios, uh, University of Wollongong is, um, oh, okay, actually, yeah, this is a good question. So like, uh, so I just got a question here that says, what does, uh, when does Casper happen? So Casper, um, so what they do is they give you three dates, right? And the three dates are stipulated in the GEMSAS guide. I forgot what they were. I think it's like, it's like May 8th, 13th and 31st or something like that. So, so, something along those lines or something like that. And what happens is you just get a choice um, to do the CASPA in one of those three dates. Um, there is no difference as to when you do it. It's really dependent on your own comfort. And, um, uh, and uh, you don't have to sit the Casper multiple times for both universities. You, you just sit the Casper once and then that one score, let's say if you apply for UOW and then UND, um, uh, you, you need to, um, uh, sorry, I'm just getting distracted by the chat. Um, yeah, so if you apply for UOW and UND, um, you, you only need to sit the Casper once and then that score applies for both universities. It doesn't apply for just once. You don't have to sit it twice. Um, one of the things is, so if we're not applying to Wollongong or Notre Dame, we don't need to worry about the CASPA. That is true. Yeah. Because other universities don't have the CASPA. It's only those two universities that have it. Cool. So let's go through portfolio. So portfolios, um, so there used to be a UND portfolio that doesn't exist anymore. That was replaced by the CASPA, which is why I'm sort of banging on the CASPA. If you're applying for UND, it's really, really important to like do the CASPA right. Um, but for portfolios, that's Wollongong only now. Portfolios are a big deal. It, it's a, it, it takes a while to write it. It's a very, very important document that you need to put a lot of time and effort into. Do not wing your portfolio. And because like medical, medical schools will, 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 will know how much effort you put into it. That's one. And two, um, it is a differentiating factor between students when it comes to applying for the, um, the University of Wollongong. And um, I, from, and um, I, I didn't apply for the University of Wollongong, from, but from what I've heard, it's it's a it's a it's an important, a very 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 important part of the application. So, um, yeah, and the University of Wollongong is the only uni that requires a portfolio. So you need a portfolio and a personal statement. So a personal statement um, is separate. It's it's like actually no, it's not really separate. It's like it's like separate, but it's also attached to the portfolio. It's basically uh, the the personal statements like this um, sort of statement about who you are and then sort of why you want to go to the university and then the rest of the uh, portfolio they have a bunch of domains that um, the university sort of advises you to write about um, that that can all be found in the University of Wollongong application area and then just read through it and then see what sort of restrictions they give you to write that portfolio and just try to um, reflect on your life and and write something about that. Um, we at Phrases, we have portfolio services that we can assist you um, to sort of, um, sort of like, I guess, touch up the portfolio and sort of think about how um, sort of these, I guess, like how to best articulate your experiences on, on a page if you're interested. Um, but, um, you, you know, it's something that you can also definitely do yourself. Cool. Um, I got a question. Do you have to be religious to go to UND? No, you don't. And that's a that's a, that's that's definitely not for any university. Um, is the university okay? No, that's it. Okay, that's that's all for the moment. Okay, so personal statements, UND and Macquarie. Uh, sorry, actually, that's not right. Uh, it's not UND. It's for um, University of Wollongong. So personal statements, as I said, it's University of Wollongong and Macquarie. Um, uh, it's not really a portfolio for Macquarie. It's 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 just a statement that sort of outlines 
why you want to go to that particular university. Um, and as I mentioned, it, it's um, like, it's, it's not a portfolio, it's just sort of like a precursor to it. And um, it's, it's important that you put effort into writing it um, and that you, you, you really write it properly because there's a word limit and um, you need to ensure that every single word that you put on that page has weight. Um, I didn't have to write one, so I'm, I'm not the best at sort of giving advice about personal statements, but um, I, from what I've heard, it is something that you, you, you need to really think about and you know, get multiple people to read to give you feedback on. Cool. So rural documentation. So um, for anyone that has any rural bonuses, really, really important that you, um, you first off, you understand that you have, um, you like, uh, I guess you can apply for rural bonuses. Like it's first important that you, like, to, to, to recognize that you can actually apply for rural bonuses. The second thing that you need to do is to make sure that you read the guide so that you know when the rural bonuses and the evidence that for that for those rural bonuses are are due, because you don't want to get to a point where you've assumed that you have these rural bonuses, you have all the documentation ready, but then you don't read the guide and then you miss the deadline. So, I'm just really banging on how important it is to read the application. Like so many people get weeded out because they just don't read and like they just take things for granted and then you know and then just it screws them. So don't be one of those people, especially when it comes to medicine. Uh, put your academic transcript, make sure to pay your fees. As I'm, I'm, I'm banging on about it before, I'm banging on about it again. Pay your fees, make sure that your application um, doesn't have any issues and, and, and yeah, and you're just, um, you, your, your university will release your transcript. So make sure that that's, that's, that's there. Um, I've got a question here. If you are a non-rural applicant and you do not have any work experience in a rural area, will you be disadvantaged when applying? It really depends on what, um, university you're applying to so for the most part no because you you know they don't discriminate on people like medical schools are very fair they they won't just pref preferentially pick rural students or people who you know um do not have evident uh, you know experience in a rural area but there are some universities that do actually look at rural students more than others but they mentioned that in the gem sas guide so if you want to know which universities are specifically like looking for more rural type students or you have rural, or, or that provide more rural bonuses, then look at the guide and see sort of what they provide. From my understanding, so the University of Wollongong is, is, has a significant um, rural medical um, sort of um, uh, like, I guess, focus. Yeah, like a big medical, uh, yeah, like a big rural medical focus. Um, so that they're one of the, those universities where a rural background and also a rural, like rural experience goes a long way. Another university where that goes a long way is Deakin University because they specifically give you bonuses based on what you've done. Um, and one of those things is um, also if you are a rural or have experience in a rural area. Um, what is rural documentation? Is this needed for international students? Um, yeah, international applications are a bit tricky. I'm not a personal um, sort of expert at that because I, I didn't apply internationally. And I believe we'll probably have another webinar for international applicants. Um, but for rural documentation, it's it, it differs for different universities. I don't know what they are. Um, so basically different universities uh, will accept specific documents that will prove if you're rural or not. Um, but you have to read the guide to ensure that you have a document that complies with their rules. So once again, make sure to read the document. Um, I'm confused, sorry. Do only UniMelp students have to pay their academic transcript fees or everyone who applied to UniMelp? No, no, like every single, like every university in general, right? Will have like some sort, like you'll have to pay some sort of fee. Like it, it, this is like an, in, this is internal fee. Right. So like, it, it, and it's usually something called like a student amenities fee or something like that. And make sure that if you have any outstanding fees from your university that you have not paid. Right. And this is, this is not just a uni melting. This is every single university. Um, make sure to pay them because you want to make sure that you uh, are not locked out of your transcript at all. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> uh, it's um, it's 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 not just a uni mail thing. It's a, it's like in every university sort of thing. If they have any fees for you to pay, just pay them. Like don't don't like skimp on that, um, because then they might withhold your transcript because you haven't paid. And then if they withhold your transcript, they won't send it to GemSAS when you put the application in. Okay, 
For Deakin, is it any is is it any relevant work or clinical experience or just real clinical work experience they take into account? So once again, like that's a question that um uh look it's a really good question i've got a little uh, sort of area here that sort of tells so so this screenshot here on the side is um what um deacon says on their gemsas application but then there's a whole other page below this that that gives you more information about it so relevant prior clinical experience work experience deacon study adjustments rural or regional residency um demonstration of financial disadvantage so if you have any of these you get four percent or two percent bonuses on your score. So let's say if you have like a 6.6 .6 GPA, you get a 4% bump on your score if you are if you have relevant prior clinical experience. Um, and the more bonuses you have, the higher percentage you're going to get on your sort of application bonus. So it, and, it, and it applies to everything. It applies to GPA. It applies to um, your GAMSAT score. Like you just get all of these small bonuses. So then you're, you know, like for example, if you have a 10% bonus and you get like a 67 in the GAMSAT, you might, that, that score would transit to like almost a 74, which is like super competitive. So that's sort of like, like with Deacon specifically, that's, that's, this is what it is because this is specifically from the guide. But if you want to know more information about it, read through the rest of the guide. Um, what is considered relevant prior clinical experience? Read the rest of the guide. Like I, I can't answer that question because um, I haven't read the rest of the guide because <laughs> um, it's not relevant to me. But um I'm just telling you that um, specifically for Deacon, you should read the rest of the guide for that. Um, okay. Uh, Sukrit, is that how I pronounce your name? Yep. Yes. Yeah, sorry. I just had a very specific question to oh. the degree that I'm doing. So oh. I'm currently in my third year of my um, bachelor's of nursing. Mm -hmm. um, and I do not get the results of my this year, like SEM1 results until like, after July. So I'm assuming that I can't really apply this year. No, 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 no. You can definitely apply this year. So um, it's, look, essentially what happens is if you are like, once you apply now, right? Yeah. You'll submit your application by the end of May, but they mm -hmm. don't sort of take your transcript immediately. They take okay. your transcript after your first semester, like before they make offers, they have to put everything in because they know that you have to finish first semester first. Like, yeah. like they can't just, you know, give you an offer without seeing your first semester results. So, yeah. and that's the same with every single like course, by the way. So it's not like, so you're not in the same boat. Um, right. So once you get all your results, they'll get your transcript and then they'll give you an offer based on your current most up-to-date GPA to that point, plus your GAMSAT plus whatever other bonuses you put in. Make sense? Right. Yeah. So you can definitely do it. The only thing that you might not be able to do is to calculate your own GPA, but you can after you've sort of yeah. got your result. Yep. Yeah. All good. Yep. But you. you can definitely apply hundred percent. Yeah. Yep. Cool. All righty. Um, so, all right, let me just finish this. Cause I'm getting a lot of questions about like Deacon stuff. Like, I'm going to talk about more Deacon stuff, guys. Don't worry. Don't worry. Like it's it, like, and, and, and like we can spend a good like 15 minutes talking about Deacon if you want, but I, I just want to get through like preferencing and CSP, BMP and stuff. Cause I think that's really important to sort of thrash out. So preferencing advice question that I always get for people like in general, right? What should I put first? What should I put second? I'm just going to sort of debunk a few myths here. First off, it doesn't matter what you put first, second, third or fourth. It, it really, really doesn't matter. The reason why is um, because if let's say you put Unimel first and then you put um, uh, like, I don't want to be disrespectful to another university, but like if you put, let's say um, like, like, you know what, let, let's just use the example of Deacon, like Deacon second, but you have no bonuses. So like the, um, so the Unimel GPA cutoff, let's say is like really high. And um, the, uh, let's say the GAMSAT cutoff is also super high, right? And then for Deakin, let's say like the cutoffs are not too high, right? Like compared to Unimel. What they'll do is they'll look at your preference and be like, okay, you do not, like you can't um, uh, get an offer at the University of Melbourne, right? Because you, uh, you don't meet the GPA and the GAMSAT requirements for it. So then they'll look at the second preference and be like, okay, do you, do you fit the bill for, for Deakin? And then let's say it's a yes, then they'll give you a, an interview offer for Deacon. The, the catch here is to put the universities that you want to get in to first. So let's say if like, you know your scores, 
like uh, nowhere near the University of Melbourne, but you, but, but you really, really want to go to the University of Melbourne. Like there's no difference. Like, there's no harm in putting the, it, like the University of Melbourne first and then putting the second university that you really want to get, to, get into second. And then the third university that you really want to get into third. So put it in order of preference, in, in order of your preference. Don't put it in order of what you think you might get into. So a common mistake that a lot of students do is they put like Unimelb fifth. And then they put like, um, let's say, um, like they have a low chance of getting into Unimelb, but then they have a really high chance of getting into like UND, for example, right? And they put UND first, but then they really want to go in like to Unimelb. They don't want to go to UND, for example, right? Or like they want to go into UND, but they don't compare comparatively to Unimelb. They want to go to UND. Oh, sorry, to comparatively to Unimelb, they don't want to go to UND as much as they want to go to Unimelb, right? What happens is um, it's sort of like a wasted spot if you put Unimelb fifth, right? You might as well just put it first because if you don't sort of re reach the criteria to get into Unimelb, they'll just cross that off the list and they'll go to your second preference, or your third preference and your fourth preference until they find a university that fits the bill. So the first university that that you apply for an that you um, that your scores sort of uh, sort of um, qualify for an interview with, um, that's the university that, the, that 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 will give you an interview. That's sort of like how that works. So I know it's a very long-winded explanation. It's probably not the best explanation that I've ever given, but um, bottom line is when you're putting your preferences in, don't put your preferences in order of like what you think you might get, like put your preferences in order of what you want to, so like, like which university you would prefer to get into first, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. And don't leave any gaps like they give you six preferences use all your six preferences like medicine is a degree i always tell these people like um medicine is a degree where like you sort of have to like you can't be picky with where you go it's a very hard degree to get into and it's a very hard degree to complete and it's a privilege to get in and um ultimately you sort of need to be flexible with where you go and um having options everywhere is the best it maximizes the chances for you to get in so yeah. Um, so, how many preferences do we get, and are there any other unis that that um, that don't that you don't need to apply to get through for GEMSAS? Okay. So, you get six for GEMSAS, and then separately, you you can apply for the University of Sydney and Flinders University. So, technically speaking, you can you can have your you can sort of dip your hands into eight for GEMSAS. You'll only get one interview, right? And that one interview is for the is for the one university that you qualify for an interview for. But here's the catch: if you interview somewhere, and let's say like you don't get in to that particular institution, you can get into other institutions um, that you've put on your preference list. This is why I I say it's so important to fill your preference list out. So, because I know a few of my friends who have interviewed at the University of Melbourne, but then they got offers to Deakin University. So um, don't um, so don't think that like, oh, just because you got a uni Melbourne interview, it's impossible for you to get anywhere else. No, it's definitely possible. It, it's likely improbable, like it's, you know, less, less likely than, than the normal, but it's still likely. So fill out all your preferences, like use all six. Put them in order of what you prefer, of which universities you'd prefer to go to, and um, and and um, yeah, that's that's sort of um, like what I would advise to you for preferencing. Um, okay, so let's see. Okay, I've heard that unis may see your preferences, so it may look bad if you put a uni at a low preference. Is this a myth? Seriously, if you're concerned, if you're concerned about that, then um, you you're wasting your brain space. Don't worry. So don't, don't, don't even think about that. Like put, be, be honest about where you want to go. It's like, don't worry. <laughs> Seriously, don't, like, that, that's like, I'm not going to say if it's a myth or not, because I don't know, like for sure if it's a myth, but it, it's not going to affect your application at all. Does not matter. Um, so if you are skipped over by your first preference for, for an interview and interview at your second preference, and you interview strongly, would the first preference still use your interview score from second preference to consider you for an offer that has the, okay, right. So that's a good question. So basically what this person's asking is, if you've interviewed for your second preference, can you still get into the university for your first preference? Um, 
So I would, uh, that's a, that's a really good question. It's a really good question. I would say logically no, because um, if you uh, were to get in, if you were to get an interview for your second preference and they skipped your first, that means you probably didn't, uh, uh, you know, uh, qualify for an interview for your first. Um, that being said, that is a good question to ask GemSAS because it's good to clarify that with them. So maybe for whoever asked me that question, maybe you can email this email, the info at GemSAS email and just clarify with them whether that's actually, whether um, it works like that or not. But logically speaking, from what I'm thinking, I, I don't think that's possible. That they could only give you universities that are sort of like, that that have a re that, that you fit the bill for the requirements, including the GPA and including your your game set for example because the interview isn't the whole application it's only it's only a portion of it um so do lower preferences use the score from your higher preference that you've interviewed for assuming you didn't get into the higher preference uni or do you also need to do that uni's interview you only do one interview so you have one interview only for gemsas and that is the that is the interview that is used to consider you for any medical spot in GEMSAS universities, that's it. Okay, I was looking at the fees for the academic transcript. I could not find any outstanding fees, but I have not paid any either. I did see that it cost $22 to get a transcript. So no, 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 that's not the fee. So if you don't have any fees, then it's fine. Like, but like, like maybe, maybe only like, you know, like maybe some universities don't actually have like a, a student amenities fee, but like, may, look, I maybe I just like confuse everyone with that, but, um, what I'm saying is like, if you do have any fees, just make sure to check. And if you, if you um, haven't paid any fees to the university for um, sort of any sort of student amenities or any sort of like subject fees that are compulsory or whatever like that, you know, if you don't pay that, then um, they could, they can withhold your transcript and you don't want that to happen. Um, the $22 fee to get your transcript, that that's not, that's not the fee I'm talking about. All right, to clarify, if you attended an arts university, do you need to request and pay for your academic transcripts from your uni in order to upload them? No, GEMSAS automatically gets them. If you're from an arts university, they just get it from those universities automatically. If you're part of a non-arts university, then you need to print out, well, essentially you need to get your transcript from your university and then manually give it to GEMSAS. Cool. So, um, all right, just before we run out of time, I'm just going to go through this, like, uh, like these, these last few, these last few things. So, um, another question I, I always get is the differences between CSP, BMP and full fee. Like, if, is there, a, well, specifically CSP and BMP, full fee is relatively self-explanatory, but I'm just going to run through it just in case. So, um, I just want to quickly have a, sort of, a bit of an understanding from the chat. Do you guys know what the difference is between CSP and BMP? Yes, no, like you can put it in the, like in the chat, Yoki. yes, no clue. Okay, all right, okay, sweet. All right, okay, okay, okay. You know what, I'm getting a lot of no's. So CSP stands for Commonwealth Supported Place, okay? For anyone in Australia, that basically means that your, your medical degree is covered by HEX. That's basically what it is. Like you don't have to pay any fees, you don't have to serve any like rural placements and, you know, like after you finish your whole degree is hexed, just like your undergrad was, right? BMP stands for bonded medical place. Bonded medical place is essentially the same as a CSP place, like literally the same. You get, it's everything is hexed. Everything is the same. The only difference is after you finish um, your medical degree, you have a sort of a contract that you signed with the government that says that you are going to serve a certain period of time of your medical practice in the future in a rural area. So those uh, sort of, um, and that, that length of time changes depending on which year you get in um, as a BMP student. Um, and, uh, it's, it's, and that's basically the only difference between BMP and CSP, right? So I'm actually a BMP student. So I know that in the future, I'm going to have to serve three years in a rural area, um, to, uh, to essentially fulfill the contract requirements of getting a BMP medical spot. Now, a lot of people then ask me, oh, you know, what, what are the, what are the advantages and the disadvantages of this? Right. So 
Um, so the good thing, uh, so first off, the, the, the advantage between both those spots is they're both hexed. So you don't worry about anything in that way. You don't pay, well, like you don't pay upfront for everything, right? So the text, the, a lot of people have a lot of issues with like working really all that sort of stuff. Here's the reality of the situation, all right? If you want to specialize, you have to work really. Okay, this is, I didn't like, and, and, and this is just like general advice. Like it is very, very likely that you're going to have to work really if you want to specialize. Like that's what I've been told by pretty much all my doctors as well. Like it's just super, super like important. If you have to serve a rural um, sort of um, practice in the future for BMP, it's like not a bad thing at all. Um, you're also giving back to uh, and to areas of Australian um, low socioeconomic healthcare, which is extremely important. And um, you learn so much when you go out and work really much, much more likely a lot more than what you would in a in a um, sort of metro area because you have a lot more independent um, sort of learning opportunities when you're in rural areas. And also um, you get uh, a lot more sort of like one-on-one -on -one, um, time with patients where you can build proper relationships with them because they're in smaller communities. So there's actually a lot of um, benefits to uh, working rurally, doing placements rurally, um, learning about rural medicine, it is actually extremely good. So for the people out there that are thinking to themselves, oh, you know, look like BMP is, you know, not great um, because, you know, I have to go really like, please reconsider and think to yourself about the actual implications for yourself in the future. Like not everything is just about like family and staying in metro areas or that sort of stuff. Like, um, you know, uh, as I mentioned, there's, a, there's a whole different field and a whole side of medicine that you won't see if you don't go rurally and you'll sort of limit your own uh, career if you don't do it anyway so whether or not you're CSP or BMP to me it's basically the same because if you're CSP and you want to specialize you're going to have to go rurally regardless so you know like you know take what you will in my opinion CSP BMP is pretty much the same full fee is the only difference it's like well yeah you have to pay for your whole degree that's and and, and that's self-explanatory now to ask a to answer a few questions about CSP and BMP. Um, can you choose which spot you get? Yes. So, well, I mean, not yes, but you can choose which spot you'd like to be considered for. So when you, when you put in your application, right, they'll have like tick boxes and the tick boxes will be like, do you want to be considered for CSP, BMP, or, and then you can tick both, right? And then, and then there's, and then for some universities that offer full fee, they'll also have a little box that says full fee as well. So then you can just pick. Can you pick what rural town you go to um, from? Okay. So I haven't actually read through like the particular regulations from, from my understanding. Yes, you can. Um, but, um, but, but there might be some regulations behind that. I'm not hundred percent certain. Um, yeah. That's, that's all I can sort of say about that. Cool. So um, next one, bonus points and Deacon specificities um, or, and Deacon specifics. So, uh, I think I've already covered that. Um, so it's just this sort of um, uh, sort of side here where it's um, it's in the GEMSAS sort of application guide. So just take a look at all of this and, and read through um, the rest of the guide uh, to get a bit of an understanding as to what specific bonuses um, you can get and then what actually constitutes as a bonus. So some people think that um, oh, you know, I have this experience in the past and that would cover um, the, the criteria, but there might be some other sort of, you know, stipulations that you need to read to ensure that your application or, or like your prior experience actually covers the specific parameters of the application. All right. Um, and then um, each university offers specifics. So yeah, as I mentioned, Previously, every single university has their own bonus points and has their own specifics that they can, that 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 they offer. So make sure to to sort of read all of that. And the last thing I just want to mention before I answer questions in the chat, um, for the rest of the time is um, cutoffs. So um, a lot of people ask me, oh, like what are the cutoffs for interviews? What are the cutoffs for, for like you know, what's the GPA cutoff? What's the, um, what's the what's the GAMSAT cutoff for all these interviews? Well. Well, what I'll do is I, I do have um, one sort of link that I can give you guys um, 
that I'll just put in the chat here. So the link is um, essentially a, it's a grad ready um, sort of link that sort of tells you like some data as to like what the GPA calculations were previously and also what the, um, what the, what the like GAMSAT cutoffs were previously. Um, Honestly, I would take all of those, um, I would take all that data with a grain of salt. There's a lot of data that we don't know um, that isn't released. Um, it's only like all of that, all of the data presented in that little link is um, is based on sort of people, based on here, like sort of like what people say and and um, only a very small subset of people that actually got in. So, so take it with a grain of salt my advice is to not worry about what the cutoffs are and just do your best. Um, one thing that you sort of get when you get into medical school is just to like, not worry about the small things and just um, try and just chill. <laughs> like just, yeah, just, just, just be as chill as possible. Um, so yeah. And also, yeah. And so like, there's a lot of like mistakes I feel with this, um, uh, like with their calculations, as I said, it's only a very small subset of of um, of data, and you can also find more data on Reddit and Paging Doctor as well. But um, once again, is is probably not um, it's probably not conducive for you guys to go through worrying about what the cutoffs are. Just go through your own application, do your do your best, and just don't worry about the extra stuff, right? Um, so yeah, that's that's my best advice for you guys. Cool. So this is it. Um, if you have any questions about anything pertaining to anything that I've said in this chat or anything to do with GEMSAS applications, please contact admin at phrasesmedical.com.au. If it's not me that gets back to you, it'll be someone else. And um, there's heaps of people here that know what they're doing, um, some, more than, some more than me as well. Um, but for the meantime, um, I'll just try and go back to the chat and sort of answer a few questions. If anyone has any other questions, please put it in the chat or you can just unmute and then ask me. Um, so I'll try to answer some of these um, questions. Yeah, look, it's no worries for uh, the talk. Hopefully it was relevant to you guys and hopefully you guys actually found it useful. But just to answer a few questions. So my study finished in 2000, Master of Agriculture Science in India. Do I need to study a master's degree or bachelor's degree for GPA? I'm an Australian citizen, thanks. Honestly, yeah, I think, yeah. So I think Michael, like what Michael said is right. I think there's a 10 year limit on tertiary qualifications, but once again, you have to check with the GEMSAS guide. All right, quick question. I will be conferring my PhD soon. You Okay, this is a long question. Um, I, I have no idea. Like, yeah, sorry, um, sorry, Ali. That's a very, very long question and a very, very difficult question to, to answer. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I can't, and also I can't give you a number of medical students in University of Melbourne who are studying medicine after a PhD. I, I really can't. Um, how strict is the five-year cumulative requirement for rural placements? If you lived in a rural place up to a really young age, like six years old, does that count? Um, it's very strict. It is very, very strict. So um, yeah, like follow the rules. Just if it says five years, it's five years. Um, and I, I would assume it's to the day. Uh, I worked as a nurse in New Zealand in rural indigenous communities. Do you think this would be considered for either clinical experience or work experience? Read the guide. I'm sorry, I don't know, 100%. But you would need to read the guide to see if that specifically qualifies. Because there's, I know that in the guide, there's a specific um, time limit in which you need to have worked in order for it to qualify. And you also need to have an activity that also qualifies um, for a rural, um, for, sort of like for that rural like bonus. Aren't there some reverse places for BMP versus CSP? For example, I think the Monash Uni, which is not part of GEMSAS, BMP spots may be less competitive, so it may be easier to get in. I mean, probably, yeah, but I mean, I'm not sure um, how, I'm, I'm, I'm really not sure about Monash because I, I didn't go to Monash, so I didn't apply. Um, so, so I'm really not sure. Um, what are roughly the full fee figures for the unis? Uh, look, that's that's really hard to say. I, I think it differs really slightly for different universities, but it's it's a it's about three hundred and fifty to four hundred k, which is which, but that's for your whole degree. That's for your whole degree. Um, can I order my preference for CSP and BMP? Um, 
I don't think you can, but what you do is you just, because you'll be considered for both spots if you tick the box. So if you tick CSP and you tick BMP, you'll be considered for both spots. If you tick full fee, you'll also be considered for that too. Um, and I think that's all there. Okay, what, what else? Um, thank you for the chat, all the best. Yeah, cool. Um, and I know there were some questions at the very start. Um, Hello from New Zealand, currently in Fiji. I'm a bit nervous. Okay, that's fine. Uh, about you, Sid, do you know a, what is a safe GAMSAT score to get in? Sorry if this is beyond the scope of the seminar. Yeah, yeah, this is a bit beyond the scope of this seminar. I'm, I'm going to be holding another seminar um, in about a week's time. I think next Saturday it will, will be the USID one. So um, I'll, I'll be talking about everything you said in that one um, and sort of telling my story about how I messed that up <laughs> the first time. Um, so if you want to join in for that one, I, I can answer that question. Um, but um, you, but just to give you a little broad overview, um, you said um, gem like gamsat uh, cutoffs are usually like really high. Um, so you said requires GPA calculation via Q, uh, QS or UAC. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So um, yeah, so the GPA calculation for you said is 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 also in a separate entity. Look, I'll, I'll run through all that next week. Just don't worry about it now. Um, what else? I meant to ask you, do you have friends that are doing medicine after a PhD? I mean, yeah, I do a couple, but I mean, um, I, I can't give you a figure as to like how many, you know, um, yeah. Cause I know like if you, if you get a PhD, I know that your GPA pretty much is seven. So that's like that. I mean, that's cracked, right? Like, like you're like, you like, you know, like your GPA is like perfect, which is a huge advantage. So, um, you know, if, if you are a person that has a PhD, that's pretty good. So, um, you know, like you, you pretty much probably won't have to worry about a GPA. For the other GEMSAS unis, is there any advantage competition wise for us to be BMP versus CSP? No, there's no advantage to be either one. Like, I mean, it's an advantage for you if you pick CSP and BMP because you open up pretty much double the spots to 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 get into medicine if you only tick csp like you're only limiting yourself to those spots like that's basically like you know um yeah so i mean yeah like just weighted of numbers you know like I, I also applied for full fee as well because like you need as many spots as you can like it's it's hard to get it's really hard to get in guys like it's not it's not it's it's not easy so like don't skimp on stuff and 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 try to you know apply for everything um with unis that have a super high cutoff, if you have a very high, if a very, very average GAMSAT, but a GPA of seven, wouldn't putting that uni into one of the six preferences be a waste? Um, no, not really. Like, I, I mean, like you've got six preferences and there's only like eight universities. Like, I mean, are you really not going to be putting a university that you really want to get into or like you realistically can get into in one of the six, if you only have eight universities to really choose from, like, I mean, you sort of have to think about it that way. Like, I, I feel like that's a very niche scenario. Um, do you know if you can apply to one, to one uni more than once, but through different pathways? Um, no, you can't apply to, like, for example, if you want to go to UniMelb, you can't apply to, like, for UniMelb, through UniMelb, and also through GEMSAS. Um, actually, no, I lied. Like, there is a way that, that you can't, well, you know what, I really don't want to go into that. Like the way is like, you have like, is if you've got like a 99 ATAR and you, and, and you have like a guaranteed med spot and you have a 75 plus like, um, like a wham at UniMelb and you want to do full fee. And I think you, if you are specifically in that category, you can apply for a, the UniMelb med spot specifically through University of Melbourne. But like, we're talking just broadly, no, like you can only apply for GEMSAS universities only through GEMSAS. You can't apply through them anywhere else. Um, yeah. And I think that's about it. Um, I think that's about it. So, right. I know it was a huge word vomit. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, yeah, hopefully that was... Um, oh, oh, no, I meant like if you did rural pathway versus domestic entry. Um, no, you can't apply... Oh. Wait, do you know if you can apply to one more uni, one uni more than once? No, no, like you can't, you can't apply for like different, like you can't apply for the same university rurally in one, like once rurally and then another time like through a, like Metro. If you put one application, they'll consider you for everything. So um, 
here. Sorry, I'm not sure which eight universities are there. Will I get the list? Yes, yes, you will get the list. Just read the guide. Guys, seriously, I'm just going to tell you guys, read the guide. Don't be one of the people that just hasn't read the guide and then they mess it up. Medical applications is genuine. It's, 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 not a, it's not funny stuff. Like it's serious stuff that like you need to be educated on like everything in order to make sure that you don't get it wrong. Read through the guide. Um, so uh, I'm gonna be confused about the one GEMSAS interview. If you only do one interview and different unis may have different styles of interviews, how do the uni standardize their interview performance? Don't ask me, ask the universities. That's, that's, a, that's a good question for the, like, that's, a, that's a good question for them. Like if, if we knew that, then like imagine how much great knowledge would have and would be able to share if we knew that. Like I, I, I can't answer that question, but they do standardize it somehow. Uh, why do you need to work rural to specialize? Well. Uh, that's a good question um, to ask like um, a doctor. Uh, it's probably like a bit too um, like sort of advanced for the moment, but essentially like it comes down to like when you specialize, you need to show experience and you need to have um, points um, that you need to accumulate over time um, for some specialties. And then essentially like working rurally, just, just it looks good on your CV. It, it, it gives you more life experience, you know, when you go out and, and you actually take care of a, um, of, of people in a rural setting it's um, it, it you learn so much like when you go out there it, you can bring those skills back with you um, and it just looks yeah and, and and you get a lot of points for it from what I understand as well so it's there's a lot of that stuff you'll get introduced to all of that when you get into medical school you don't have to worry about that um, so yeah um, will there also be a webinar for international students soon I, probably I mean like if not then I'll just bring it up with like you know upper management so and then we can get it sort of sorted you know um are these webinars recorded if so where we can, where where can we find it if we want to rewatch this video um yeah i mean i mean i recorded this one um like in terms of where you can find it i i don't know probably youtube yeah no yeah, yeah no no youtube youtube yeah yeah, yeah no, definitely youtube just check the phrases gams that youtube channel or the phrases medical youtube channel which one of those two and this will be on it and my also my talk last week for the casper is also on that i, I just remembered so yeah just go watch it on youtube um, so yeah, I uh, just want to, just want to cover how practicums, practicums are calculated with GPA if it's a pass fail. Sorry. What does that mean? <laughs> like if it's a pass fail, how do you practice, how do you calculate your GPA? Um, yeah, look, that's a good question. Um, they probably give you a score. In addition to the pass fail, like, I'm I'm sure I'm sure there would be. Or if it was a pass fail, like um, probably best to ask Jim Sass. Sorry, like I'm um I'm, I'm decent at knowing sort of broadly what to do, but in terms of the specifics, I'm not like the I'm not the absolute best because I'm not uh, I'm not going through the process right now like you guys are. Um, how and where can we find work experience for a medical application? I'm in second year of my clinical science degree. It's a good question. Um, probably good to read. Um, uh, probably good to read the guide first to see exactly what work experience would constitute um, a satisfactory sort of job for that, to give you a bonus on your application and then sort of try and find work there but i'm pretty sure there are very that but guys you have, you have to remember there are very strict guidelines as to sort of what the work has to be and also how long you've had to do the work because they they need to protect from students just doing it for like six months and saying hey uh, work experience you know like it, it's a lot more sort of yeah it's a lot more strict than than, than that yeah and yeah and amy said yeah it's a any work that's more than 36 hours a week for two years consistently. Yeah. So see someone's someone's read the guide. Read the guide, guys. Read the guide. And contact GemSAS. Oh. Hopefully that was helpful for you guys. Um, I really uh, appreciate um you're being great at listening um yes i've also i've just answered that question so will there be a, a webinar for international students well um probably and i'll and if not then i'll probably just mention it and say that it's something that you guys want will this, will this
medicine in universities, you're studying in A and want to study medicine in B. Uh, yes. I mean, yeah. Like if you're in Uni Melbourne, you want to get into UQ, it's exactly what you would do. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Good luck for your GEMSAS applications, everyone. And um, make sure to look at the deadlines and read the guide. Okay.